Okay, the trumpet announces the coming of our true hero. And I'm mentioning the term true hero is coming uh, because we've had a lot of false heroes in the last two generations. Last two generations will put us back toward the end of World War II in that time period. Um, and a lot of false heroes that actually have killed millions of their own citizens. And we'll get to that. Really evil men. Actually, the pattern started in the French Revolution. It was a much smaller scale than the horrors of the communists, but, but the pattern, ph philosophically, the worldly pattern was there. Um, during the French Revolution, you know, the mobs came out, and they said, well, we're going to create a utopian socialist paradise. They got rid of religion. They got rid of the seven-day week calendar. All that didn't work in the long run, but they, they tried it, 10-day week. Um, they, they murdered the priest, said there's me no more religion. One of the leaders of the revolution, Robespierre, he brought something which he called revolutionary terror. That is, we're going to terrorize the population to make sure they are pure revolutionaries. Now, you, you know, terrorizing people to create utopia almost sounds contradictory, but I'm not making this up. You read the history books, Rose Pierre came up with it. They'd achieved this utopia by terrorizing it. Um, matter of fact, he's, the, although it's been quoted many times afterwards, he's the first one to actually write the expression, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet or crack a few heads. In other words, the ends justify the means. Do you think of anything more devilish than that? Because we have this lofty, utopian, socialist paradise, we have to murder people and expunge people that we don't like, um, so be it. Um, so they murdered a lot of priests. And they decided we're going to have a sanitary, clean executions. So they invented a machine called the guillotine. If you've seen a picture of it, it's this big, giant blade, and it slides on these uh, runners. It's real high, and they stick your neck in there and release it. And of course, and then they have a basket. And you can see uh, drawings of heads of many people uh, in the ba heads of people in the basket that weren't pure enough in their support of the revolutionary. They had to get pure and pure. Now, there's a great story about the American ambassador. They're from France um, during Washington. Well, I, I've got the exact time period, but during the Washington and maybe a few years before administration. And of course, he came back. We citizens, you know, they call everybody citizens. We're going to create this wonderful thing. And within a year, he was afraid to go back to France. His party was now on the guillotine chopping block. He said, you got to give me political asylum. That's an interesting story if you ever read it. That's how bad it got. The revolution uh, got to the point it became a mother who feeds on her own children. I mean, that's literally what the revolution became. They pushed for more and more revolutionary purity. Being moderate, you can't be moderate. The guillotine. The irony of it is Rose Pierre, who came up with all this terror, guess what happened to him? Guillotine. Actually, they think that some of the, his supporters, they saw so many of their friends getting guillotined, that they said, well, we might be next. This guy is out of control. So they framed him and got him. It was even the people who were killing people got killed themselves. That's what I mean by it got out of hand, got out of control. Um, it, it was kind of mob rule. And mob rule is not a good thing. If you look at the Founding Fathers of America, the reason they put all those checks and balances, they did not want mob rule. Uh, I, we can talk about the Constitution later, but you get the general idea. And obviously that revolution, that Constitution didn't last. It ended up being a military dictatorship under Napoleon. 50,000 people were killed. Now you're going to say, well, compared to what the communists did, it looks like small chains. So I concede that, but still pretty gruesome stuff if you read about it. The Jacobins were some of the major parties that were pushing for purity among the, the revolution. I didn't hear something shocking on the radio. One of the ladies, her name was Dunn, who signed the letter to the media about 
uh, the media shouldn't put Giuliani on regarding uh, Biden's scandals is someone who said she admired Mao Zedong. It's just interesting. So a connection between American politics and, and Mao Zedong. <laughs> you ought to watch, there's some, um, comp, there's some educational videos about Mao Zedong, and I have plenty of books. I've got one, The Little Black of Communism, Little Black Book of Communism. Uh, Mao Zedong probably murdered more just because China's population is bigger than anybody else. But I'll just tell you a little bit of his story, because I think sometimes we don't realize just how bad some of these people were. Uh, and, and they say it was kind of luck that he survived and all the, when they did their mountain retreat from the nationalist government and from the Japanese during the war, that all the people ahead of him got killed. And so he ended up being the senior man. I wonder if that was luck or was that the devil. But regardless, um, he asked when they were in the camp, he was disciplining them to become his own personal army that would do anything for him. But at one point he said, well, can we make improvements? Anybody want to make improvements? And some young guy came up with some improvements need to be made. He put them on a bulletin board. He was just trying to see if anybody would dare think outside his box. And then we, we discovered that he actually enjoyed seeing people tortured. He was a sadist. Uh, of course, so was Hitler, but we, some of these stories you probably already know. But one of the things was they came up with some crazy ideas they got from Russia on um, agriculture and harvesting. I won't go into the details, but it didn't work. And he was letting, deep in the countryside, millions of Chinese starve. So one Communist Party leader, his um, second in command, said, we've got to put a stop to this. It's just not working. Mao was shocked. Somebody dared criticize his program. So they had to put a halt to it. I won't go into all the details, but they said Mao plotted to get this guy, but he was so popular within the party, he just couldn't get him that way. So he created something called the Red Guard. And he got all these young kids, mostly teenagers, you know, 12 to 18, and they, and they were giving them a little red book called the Little Red Book of Mao, and they waved it and they had rallies and all that. He said, you have to purify the revolution. Some of your teachers have bourgeoisie ideas, especially the intellectual ones. And they show the example of one where these young people rushed in and they beat the principal of the school to death and some of the other teachers, um, and including many of their own parents who may have said something or they thought they said and they even falsely accused people just to give them somebody to target. I, mean, I know this is hard to believe. Millions of young Chinese people run around, and they, and they heal out there to go for a year. And then eventually, they found a way to get the mob to get his lieutenant, the guy the second in charge. Um, that was his whole point of doing that. Several million elderly, or let's say middle-aged and elderly Chinese, died because of that. And when you put that with the gulags and the starvation, they put his death toll 40 million. When he died, the Chinese government actually changed a lot of its policies. And internally, they knew he was wrong. But they said, wait a minute, if the Communist Party is going to survive, if we admit that Mao was wrong, that makes us look bad. So officially, the Chinese government still has some statues of Mao around, and they have not admitted to all his faults. Because I talked to a Chinese grad student about it, and he said, well, you have to take a little course in Mao philosophy and communism. Um, it's kind of part of what's required. So it, um, anyway, the man was evil. Similar things happened with Joseph Stalin and 20 million Russians. He had a reign of terror. Uh, Khrushchev said, he said, the only reason I survived, anybody that got too popular, did anything too great, Stalin got rid of him. He said, I had to act a fool around him and clown around to survive. Uh, and of course, Khrushchev denounced Stalin. As some of you may know that if you're old enough to remember that, after he died. And actually, he maybe didn't even need to die. He was sick in his room, but the guards were afraid to come in his room because he was so vindictive. They waited many hours before they went in there because I don't want to go in there and interrupt him. I may get in trouble, end up in the gulag myself. Um, 
Pol Pot, Cambodia, smaller country, but 20 to 25 percent of its population were murdered. <laughs> One of our professors at SEMO went two years ago to Cambodia. As a tourist attraction, you can go see the um, killing fields. I'm not making this up, because when you say it, it's almost so crazy, you don't want to believe it. Where they little skulls, you could, I mean, if you, not that I want to go to Cambodia, I've seen enough of Vietnam, but the point I want to get at, can you imagine that to get the purity of the revolution? Um, of course, same thing could be said for Hitler. Uh, Hitler killed a lot of regular Germans who didn't agree with him. I, I, and I'm, I'm saying this from, in a way you have to feel sorry for the German people. They got in the hands of a madman and his guys around him, you know, the Gestapo and the SS and, you know, all the things you heard about. Um, it was, I'm not saying the anti-Semitism wasn't horrible too. And they used propaganda to brainwash people to worship a man. They literally were worshiping Mao. There was no religion, no God. The little red book of Mao was like the Bible. They worshiped Stalin. They worshiped Hitler. And I guess to a lesser degree, they worship Paul Pot and Castro too. Uh, and Castro's killed people. The numbers aren't nearly as big, but and Che Guevara. The point I'm making is we've had a lot of really evil people being looked up to and worshiped in this world. And there's one more coming, the beast. We can talk about him in a later sermon, but there's one more coming who will unite probably Europe and other parts of the Western world, and they will worship a man. It's like, whoa, it is coming one more time. Um, but we want to be a true follower. So when we hear that trumpet call, we'll be able to answer it. Revelation 8, 1 and 2. Here's a parallel that I noticed in Revelation and Joshua. Revelation 8, 1 and 2. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour before they blew the trumpet. Revelation eleven fifteen. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and, and of his Christ, or Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever, like that famous song, forever and ever. <clears throat> I'm not a good singer, but you get the point. And saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who was, who is and was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. When that trumpet sounds, Jesus Christ is going to take over the governments of this world, whether they want it or not. That's the only way you can make this world a paradise is the right kind of force by the right person. He's coming uh, as a, well, the way it's written in the book of Revelation, as a hero on a white horse. Um, by the way, when Joshua brought the Israelites to the promised land, by the way, you know the name Joshua is Joshua in Hebrew, but the name Joshua in Greek and English is Jesus. They're the same name, it's just that it's Joshua in Hebrew, and then in English and Greek, it's Jesus. I think in Spanish it's Jesus, but it's the same name. It's Joshua's name. Um, an interesting thing, when um, um, we know it was Christ because of the context, but you can read all about it uh, in the book of Joshua. But Joshua was told, you should have maybe the lead soldiers and the lead priest and the Ark of the Covenant walk around Jericho one time and be perfectly silent except for the blasting of those horns. And you can, they're like a piercing blast. You can imagine the people in Jericho sitting on top of the wall, that unnerving blast, but total silence. What is this? They marched around it six days. Then the seventh day they came early and they marched around it seven times. And then all of a sudden they noticed all the Israelite soldiers were joining them, maybe 600,000. It was a pretty big number. And then Joshua had them all face in, totally circling the city of Jericho, and then shout. And you can see the parallel between the book of Revelation and Joshua, and that's silence. Because silence is kind of scary in a way. And then when they shouted, an earthquake hit 
the rumble and the walls of Jericho fell out. That killed probably most of the soldiers on the wall, and then the Israelites took the city. The point is, that pattern that you see in Joshua is the same pattern that Christ will bring, um, and those trumpets will blast, and it will scare the world, and God will pour out... Um, well, let me just read Joshua 6.16. Uh, but the pattern is exactly the same thing as in Revelation. And the seventh time it happened, when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And, of course, then the wall fell down. Um, our hero is coming. And what we need to do to be part of joining Christ to make this world a paradise, a real paradise, not the false socialist paradise, is to stand fast in the truth. Stay ready now. But you never know when we're going to pass away. I mean, you know, it, who knows? I could tell you, anyway, we'll say that now, but stay ready so that whenever our end comes, either we pass away or we're alive when Christ comes back, we will be ready. By the way, after Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2 talked about the evil leader who's going to go to the temple of God, sit, put a throne right there in the holy place, and I'm sure with TV cameras on him and on the internet, and he will declare, and probably they'll have other sycophants there, declare himself God and be worshipped by the world. Right after that section, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, Here's what Paul says we should do, because that is going to happen, and not too many years ahead of us. Paul writes, 2 Thessalonians 2.14. So 2 Thessalonians 2.14 reads, To which he called you by our gospel for obtaining the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions. Stand fast fast and hold the tradition like you know they have glue that holds fast hang on because there'll be a lot of things trying to shake you loose everything you see well at least not everything but a good deal of what you're going to see on tv on the internet in literature from academia hollywood popular even some popular sports figures i would imagine as time goes on and popular singers and performers they're all going to be pushing us in the wrong direction. You can almost see it, the culture is turning that way. Um, so brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught. So if someone comes up with new doctrine, <laughs> they're the ones that have to defend it because anything that's too new, it doesn't fit the foundation we've been on. Now we can get deeper understanding of the same things we've already thought, but when they start bringing new things, we need to be suspicious, which we're taught. I'm not saying we can't learn anything new, but I'm just saying be careful, which we were taught, whether by word or our epistle. By the way, people spread false letters. They, they were counterfeit letters from Paul. Think about that. That's how deceitful some of the Judaizing party, and I think even some of the pagans, they wrote. That's why Paul says in some, you see my signature? Because they got to know what a signature looked like, because it, it was hard to imitate that. Because they write false letters, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us every lasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So Paul says, stand fast. Hold on to the truth. Hold on. Stay with the other brethren. Help and encourage the other brethren. Help God's work. Mark 13, 37. Mark 13, 37. And Mark 13 reads, Take heed, watch and pray. I think he means watch spiritual conditions, watch worldly conditions, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. And I always take that to mean, I'm not saying, you know, there are probably some prophecies when they finally happen, Maybe then we'll know that Christ is almost here. But the, but the point prior to that may come as a surprise. In other words, the world may appear to be peaceful, have worked out its problem, 
prosperity. Now, I believe they're going to be hiding some, some slave labor camps. They're going to be cheating. So the world won't see the full picture of what's going on. But what you do see, probably online and the media, things are going to look wonderful. And Satan is going to lull a lot of us to sleep. And then things happen. And it may be too late at that point to try to, I'll get spiritual when I see the end is almost here. I think that's a dangerous strategy. You know, uh, like Constantine, the deathbed repentance. I'll wait till the last second. You may not be able to. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> so he says, um, for you do not know when the time is. Verse 34, and command the doorkeeper to watch. Therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming in the evening at midnight at the crowing of the rooster early in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, and he means spiritually, and what I say to you, I say to all, watch and stay awake. Um, and by the way, the next false super pope and false dictator may be a lot more charismatic. You realize Germany was the most educated country in the world. And that's, that's a fact. You can prove that. And yet, with the help of the devil, of course, um, Hitler got in. Now, my only point is, you might think, oh, they could never fool me. Hopefully that's true. But I think it, it's more likely to be true if you stay with the church, you keep staying with the Bible, reading our material, just kind of staying spiritually sharp. Um, and just another example would be, take Venezuela. I remember when our former president was out there rubbing hands with the, <laughs> the leader of Venezuela, was bringing them into socialist communism and cooperation with Cuba. It was going to be wonderful. Venezuela went from the richest country in Latin America to they are literally, I was watching on the internet the other day, they have food lines. People are starving. They ate the zoo animals. I mean, it, I mean, it's worse than I'm making it out to be. Half the time, electricity doesn't work. The water system is bad. They have to filter the water and hope they're not drinking stuff. And a whole lot of bad things to say about Venezuela. Um, and by the way, one reason socialism doesn't work is because stealing doesn't work. Any system that violates the Eighth Commandment is bad. Now, generally what the socialists say is, we're going to take from the rich. Well, like Stalin said, we're going to take it from the kulaks. Those are the farmers. We wouldn't call them rich. Actually, they'd be poor by our standards, but they were the slightly more successful Russian farmers. They named them the kulaks. Well, let's go out there and kill all these rich people and the kulaks and take their stuff, and put them in giant government-run managed farms. And doesn't it sound good? We'll take it from the rich and we'll all have, live happily ever after. By the way, France tried that a few years ago, super high tax on the rich. They dropped it because it was a disaster. But, um, the, but here's why it doesn't work. If you undercut the most productive people, kill them, run them out of the country, whatever, that hurts your productivity. If you end profits and everybody gets the same low salary, as some Russian said, uh, they, they pretend to pay us to work, so we pretend to work. <laughs> and, uh, they, they worked as little as they had to because there's no incentive. There's no profit incentive. The only way to get ahead is to play party politics and get promoted up, and that's more backstabbing you know, political stuff. So there's a disincentive for the workers to produce and you, you intimidate, get rid of, or steal from the most productive, production plummets. You cannot redistribute what has not been produced. Think about that. The amount that you have to redistribute gets lower and lower. Everybody is pretty much in poverty. I remember uh, years ago when Khrushchev came to America, was shocked at all of our agricultural stuff, and he saw it. And most of the Russians, peasants, they really looked poor in those days, except Khrushchev, his wife had an expensive mink coat. And, and you realize the party leaders were living pretty high on the hog, and the people were, anyway, there are all kinds of stories. They'd have apartment buildings with nice fronts, but there were three families living in one apartment. 
Uh, you, there are a lot of stories you can read about. It. it was really bad. This joke is called Memory Clinic. Two aged couples were enjoying a friendly conversation when one man asked the other one. He said, Fred, how was that memory clinic you went to to help your memory? Fred said, oh, it was good. I learned things like uh, association and a visualization, various psychological techniques to help improve my memory. So he said, well, Fred, um, what was the name of that memory clinic you went to? Fred's memory was blank. He said, um, um, what's the flower with long stems? The other guy says, roses. So he said, rose. What was the name of that memory clinic that I attended? <laughs> well, sometimes you forget your wife's name. <laughs> I tell that joke to say, it seems like the world is forgetting the, the bad history of the French Revolution, the, the even worse history of the Russian Revolution, like a, uh, or the Chinese Revolution, or the fall of the Communist Empire. You know, I used to ask students, why did Stalin put up an iron curtain all across Europe, from the Baltic you know, to the Mediterranean? An iron curtain of barbed wires, walls, machine gun nests, you know, the whole thing. You know. And the students, they don't teach them anything in public school. I get one or two kids who went to private school to know the answer. One kid said, so America wouldn't invade Russia? Okay, what would America want to invade Russia for? I won't go into how stupid that is. But to keep their people in. Because it was like they were starving and poor. And as time went on, the West was more and more prosperous. Can you imagine? Why would I stay here if I can get out? By the way, you're going to wonder, why are all the immigrants pouring across America's southern border when a certain party is telling you the camps that they go to when, the, when they're picked up is horrible and they've been mistreated? People in the world know better than that. They're coming here because they know America's basically kind and generous and freedom and prosperity and where most of them live, and they may not even be the poorest of the poor, but they, many of them can get a ticket to fly to Guatemala and get on a caravan and pay uh, human smugglers to get them across the border. Because a lot of the places they live, Asia, Africa, Latin America, there's a lot of bad governments out there. There's a lot of bad things. And I don't think it's just poverty, and that's part of it, but it's also freedom, too. They know, no matter what the media tells you, uh, that America's a kind, generous, and prosperous place. That's why they're coming, really. You, I've, you talk to people from Africa, they'll say, there's, there's no racism in America. Anyway, they can tell you about what it was like in their country and what it was like here. Like, you know why I'm here. I'm blessed to be here. And that's really true. Well, anyway, that's, they had to keep people behind machine guns. It was so bad in the communist world. Well, when, you know, when the communist empire fell, they celebrated when the, when the Berlin Wall came down. People have forgotten. They don't teach them anything in history. I think they're intentionally dumbing down the public. People don't know the danger of socialism. They really don't. Um, as Carl was saying, uh, when they were talking about during the 50s and 60s, communists infiltrating our government and Hollywood, actually there's a lot of truth to that. And now I think they've taken over much of America's deep state and much of uh, Hollywood. Maybe they don't call themselves communists, but they have that socialist, um, I call it statism, where the government is everything. The government runs your life. You don't run it yourself, the government runs it. And then, hopefully, if they can do it, the leader of the government is practically worshipped. Gives all the bureaucrats more power, too. And the media backs it up with propaganda. Um, but the true God is coming. Christ is coming. A real hero is coming. Hebrews 2, 8, 9. What I want to say is God has prepared Jesus Christ specifically to give man the best possible government we can get. Hebrews 2, verse 8. Hebrews 2, 8. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, 
He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus Christ, who's made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So we're going to have a leader who really loves mankind. He loves mankind so much that he died for us. And a tough death. I mean, Christ could have taught God out of it. Remember he said right before he went to the stake, he said, not my will, but thine be done. He died for people. So he really loves mankind. Um, Hebrews 5, 2. Hebrews 5, 2. <clears throat> he, can, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself was also subject to weakness. In other words, the one, I, I'm going to give put it in my words, Certainly God understands human nature and God understands everything. But it's one thing to understand it from above. It's another thing to understand it from the inside. What it's like. But somebody says, well, you know, I understand what it's like to have cancer. I bet you don't understand what it's like, even if you're a doctor and you know all the cancer details, unless you're a person who survived years of horrible chemotherapy and radiation. In other words, if you suffer with something, you really understand it. Or someone says, well, I understand what it's like to be in prison. I've seen some prison movies, read prison books. Yeah, but did you actually live in a prison? Were you afraid of who they'd lock you in the cell with at night and what gangs were doing on the yard? That's what they call it, they hang out. And, and, and apparently there's some prisoners, depends on the prison you're in, but there are guys who make shanks and can murder people, and they're, they're in there for life for murder, so what do they got to lose? Give them two life sentences? You know, there are some scary people in some of these prisons. Well, you don't understand what prisons are like if you were in there much more than if you were just reading about it from on high. Christ knows what it's like to be human, to feel fear, like he felt before he went to the stake. And, and I'm sure he understood and learned a lot in his 33 and a half years of being human. Verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him, was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Verse 8, though he was a son, even though he was a son of God, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Sometimes you learn things the hard way more deeply than you learn things the easy way. I can't even explain it, but I know it's true. If you suffer through something, you learn it better than just reading about it. And having been perfected, people say, well, how can he be perfected? He's God. All I can say is God knows everything, but he can learn it even better. I mean, that's the best way I can get out of it. He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So. In the world tomorrow, in the millennium and the great white throne judgment, we're going to have a leader, a king, and a judge who really understands human nature. Probably people that are addicted to opium and other things. Christ will be a little kinder and more understanding. He said, we're going to take years to get you cleaned up. Um, I don't know. I, I, maybe, I, maybe Christ won't say that. But, but whatever the point I'm making is, though, he will understand human nature better and he'll be he'll have even more grace because of what he has learned and suffered um, he'll be the perfect judge the perfect king he'll understand us in a deep down level revelation 1911 revelation 1911 now i saw heaven open and behold a white horse maybe that's figurative but it doesn't really matter i always always think of the old movies when the wagon train is being surrounded and they're about to be destroyed, and they hear the trumpet blast, you know the the uh, the colonel who's next to the brigade of uh, or whatever it is regiment of cavalry, he tells his bugler, "Sound charge!" And they come over the hill, and he's on a white horse, and they put out their saber and they rush out to to save the wagon train. Well, at least you picture that in your mind. Christ is going to come on a white horse and save this world from destruction because probably chemical weapons, biological weapons, atomic weapons, and who knows, they may come up with something else we haven't even thought of when this happens. The world would mess something up. 
if God didn't come out and save the world and put down evil. So on a white horse, he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Verse 14, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. I don't think that's, that's more of a figurative statement. Whatever the spiritual weapons are, they're going to be powerful. I don't know if it necessarily comes out of his mouth. But, um, but that with it, he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Words, they're going to have to behave, whether they want to behave or not. Iran's going to have to behave, whether they want to or not. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his side the name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And actually, they even use a, a great crushing analogy uh, in that part of Revelation. The Messiah is coming to save this world. And the point of that song was, you lead and I will follow. We need to follow God, be committed to where God leads, we follow, so that when that trumpet sounds, we will be ready. Stay ready. Um, so no matter what happens, we're ready. Revelation 5.10. And I've made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. We're going to help Christ turn this world into a real paradise. And we'll learn from overcoming our sins and from our problems and things we suffer as well. Romans 8.19. Romans 8.19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The world is waiting for us. The world, the planet is waiting for us to be born into God's family. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself was also itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. They'd poison this planet if God didn't come back into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So the song we sang that I will follow till the day that trumpet rings in our ear. And I want to be there whichever way it happens and be happy to hear that trumpet sound. Know that I stayed faithful. Join Christ will join Christ in the clouds, circle the earth, land on Mount Zion, and from Jerusalem, real paradise will come to this world. Pure religion, true justice, perfect families will be taught how to become perfect families. Blessings will overflow. We'll have fabulous soil. All we have to do is follow Christ until he returns, until we hear that trumpet sound. Then we will be born into God's family.